Hey yo, do you know someone who loves true crime but isn't so taken with the podcast format? If so, you can tell them that I have published a collection of short true crime stories straight out of the Human Monsters archives. The book has been published as a Kindle on Amazon. It is called The Book of Human Monsters, 11 Harrowing Child Abuse Cases. These cases were produced far beyond the twilight of the comfort zone. The book has been formatted for talk to text and is available for reading on multiple devices. Again, that is The Book of Human Monsters, 11 Harrowing Child Abuse Cases by Morgan Rector at Amazon. Thank you. Hello everybody. Do you have an idea for a true crime podcast? I publish true crime podcasts at my YouTube channel, Leader One Studios. I currently have 23,000 subscribers who are always looking for new true crime podcasts to listen to. This is an opportunity to build an audience quickly. If you're interested in joining the Leader One Podcast Network, send an email to morgansvariety at gmail.com and we can discuss the details. Hello everybody. Gratitude to everybody for listening and additional heaps of gratitude to everybody who donates to the Patreon account. You keep the show going with your donations. As I keep the expenses paid, the more content I can create. You can donate at www.patreon.com slash leader one or if you'd like to make a one-time donation you can send one through paypal at morganrector331 at hotmail.com remember there is no minimum donation no maximum donation if one dollar a month is all you feel like you can manage especially in these difficult times it's still appreciated thank you for everything and enjoy the show Welcome to Human Monsters. The circumstances of Tommy Lynn Sells' birth did not pretend a life of honor and benevolence. He was born to a negligent single mother, Nina Sells, on June 28, 1964, in Oakland, California. When he was 18 months old, he and his twin sister, Tammy Jean, were stricken with meningitis. His sister died. The perilously high fever he suffered has been known to cause brain damage and mental illness. Speculation has it that this led to Tommy's homicidal and antisocial tendencies years later. Following the death of his sister, he was sent to live with his Aunt Bonnie in Holcomb, Missouri. He lived with her until he was five years old. He later described this period as the happiest of his life. In his fifth year, his mother retrieved him, and they moved to the town of Frisbee, Missouri. His mother forbade him from having any more contact with Bonnie. Tommy was very upset by this, having established a close and loving bond with Bonnie and his other aunts. Tommy's mother collected him because her sister expressed interest in adopting him. Tommy wound up living with his mother instead. He was neglected and struggled to survive with the lack of structure and support. Lacking in so much parental support and supervision, he was able to start drinking alcohol when he was seven years old. It was due to the lack of his mother's presence that he was able to fall into the clutches of Willis Clark at the age of eight. Clark was known throughout the community to be a pedophile. 
Tommy's mother did nothing to intervene when Tommy and Clark interacted. Clark began the process of grooming Tommy, as pedophiles do, to establish trust and comfort between them. Neglected of material goods and attention, Tommy went to Clark to get what wasn't provided at home. Having established a bond with Tommy, Willis began to molest him. These actions would make a devastating impact on Tommy's mental health in the years to come, as confirmed by Sells himself. He has noted that he would relive the sexual abuse while he committed his crimes. From the age of 10 onwards, Tommy began his career as an outlaw in earnest. He dropped out of school at that age. A letter from a truancy officer wouldn't have changed anything. It would have been left unopened. He began smoking marijuana on a regular basis. Tommy's adolescence saw a rebellious boy morph into a raging psychopath. Among other forms, it manifested as rape. When he was 13, he disrobed and climbed into bed with his grandmother. Later that year, he tried to rape his mother. Disturbed by these incidents, his family sent him to a doctor to have his mental health evaluated on an inpatient basis. When Tommy returned home, he found that not only was his family not there to welcome him, but they weren't there at all. Most of their possessions were also gone. They didn't even leave a forwarding address behind. Now that he was on his own as a drifter, Sells embarked on a career doing odd jobs and supplementing his income through misappropriation. He worked for carnivals and would stow away on trains. His first violent crime occurred soon after his family deserted him. He was angry at his mother for abandoning him. In his desire to punish her, he took out his rage on a female surrogate pistol-whipping a woman until he knocked her out. She survived the attack, and he was not charged. Tommy Sells committed his first murder at the tender age of 16 in 1979. He broke into a home and caught a man performing fellatio on a small boy. This triggered the unresolved anger he carried around due to his own experiences with sexual abuse, and he couldn't bear to see it happen to another child. Sells explained what he was feeling at the time. I did it because I was pissed off and angry, and it felt good. As far as his feelings on committing murder went, he said, it was like a heroin addict looking for that first hit of the drug again. He went on to say that he carried this anger with him as he committed his next few murders. The problem with this story is that no evidence has ever been found. The man who filleted the boy was never found. The victim has never come forward to confirm they were abused. Tommy Sells told a lot of tall tales, and this could very well have been one of them. After all, if criminals were honest people... They wouldn't be criminals. Sells lived as a transient, which enabled him to commit murder with abandon and elude capture for 20 years. This made the cases exceedingly difficult to solve. Unlike most serial killers, Sells didn't target a specific type of victim. According to his description, he killed whoever got in my way when I was having a bad day. Most of his murders had a sexual element. Rape and mutilation of the genitalia were his calling cards. 1980, the year when the bloodbath was at high tide. Shortly before his 17th birthday, he killed a man outside of a Chinese restaurant in Los Angeles with an ice pick. The man did nothing to provoke his anger. He was simply Sells' most recent fix. When Tommy Sells left Los Angeles, he reconnected with his family after assuring them he would never again attempt to rape his mother and grandmother. He lived with his mother in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1981. 
He also lived in a group home at that time. He had a girlfriend named Cindy Hanna. His life was as normal as it would get. Tommy referred to Cindy as his first love. In 1982, his son was born. Cindy's father did not approve of their relationship as he was aware of Tommy's criminal history. It didn't help that Tommy broke into and stole from the church Cindy's family attended. Sells had many girlfriends. With or without the intention to flatter, his mother dubbed him her, quote, little whore, saying he has the gift of gab. He can make any woman believe him. Tommy's relationship with his mother soured when he attempted to rape her for the second time while she was in the shower. Nina told him to leave. After Tommy left his mother's house, he was admitted to an outpatient mental health treatment center in Jonesboro, Arkansas. During the appointment, Sells said of himself, I don't know who I am. I feel like a fool for trying to attack mom. I don't understand why I did it. When questioned about the motive behind the attack, he said, She tries to run my life. I'm going to run my own life, and I don't care who I have to hurt to do it. Sells took to the road again. He worked in carnivals and did a lot of train hopping. He made sure to kill two more people in Arkansas before departing for St. Louis, Missouri. The first victim, Hal Akins, was shot by Sells when he broke into his home. Akins played dead, so Sells' body count was one cadaver short than his final tally. The second was a woman Sells claimed to have killed with an accomplice. They raped her and stabbed her to death before dumping her corpse into a lake. In July 1983, Sells was seen leaving the home of Thomas and Colleen Gill. Sells confessed years later to bludgeoning Colleen and their four-year-old daughter unto their deaths. Gill was a suspect after taking out a $600,000 life insurance policy on Colleen. He was never arrested. He was cleared as a suspect when Tommy Sells confessed. In May 1984, Sells was arrested for stealing a car. He was sentenced to two years in prison. He was released less than a year. He met Nicole Snow while he was in prison and married her. Their daughter was born before he was released. Sells was arrested for a parole violation two years later. After his release, he stole another car. Following this release, he worked as a carny again. He also underwent rehabilitation for substance abuse. While he was in rehab, Nina Sells called the police and his parole officer and informed him where Tommy was staying. A police officer called him there to ask him about a stolen car that was found in front of a donut shop in Rolla, Missouri. Concerned he would return to prison due to a parole violation, Tommy left rehab and returned to his life as a drifter. Sells' transiency brought him into contact with 35-year-old Ina Court and her four-year-old son, Rory. He met them while working at a carnival. Tommy and Ina hit it off, and she invited him to spend time with her at her house later that evening. They had sex, after which Tommy passed out. He later claimed that when he woke, he caught Ina riffling through his backpack in search of items to pilfer. He proceeded to kill her by beating her with a baseball bat and slashing her throat. He said he did the same to Rory to ensure there would not be a witness. These murders were confirmed to have happened when Ina's parents found their bodies. Rory was killed the day before his fifth birthday. One fact about this murder that has been called into question after Sell's recollection was the theft. Speculation has it that he stole from Ina, not the other way around. After all, theft was his avocation. Time was on his side. The small town in which Ina and Rory lived was policed by a small staff of officers who were ill-equipped to process something as grave as a double homicide, and they were overwhelmed. The case went cold for years. September 1984. 
Sells went back to jail. He crashed a car while driving drunk. His three passengers were underage girls. The car was totaled. It flipped and rolled three times. He was arrested for DUI and for the presence of minor age children. He sustained minor injuries. He spent the remainder of September in jail. His bid for parole was denied, and he was sent back to Missouri State Penitentiary. While Sells did his time, he was written up for creating a disturbance and for self-mutilation. Aside from these violations, he was a model prisoner. He was released on May 16, 1986. Later that year, Sells was hired to drive a tow truck. He met and married a woman named Sandy. Sells would marry many times throughout his life on the outside. The legality of the marriages is questionable since he moved around so much. He was more than likely a bigamist. One night during a shift, a prostitute called in to request a tow after her car broke down. Sells offered the opportunity to take it out and trade, have sex with him in exchange for a free tow. She declined to take him up on this offer. Sells was indignant. He had been rejected by a prostitute. He was unable to digest what he considered to be a great injustice and affront to his dignity. He shot her and dumped her body in a ditch. During another shift, a man walked up to Sells and proceeded to kick him multiple times. Sells shot him and left him to bleed out. On his way out of St. Louis, Sells was detained by police for having stolen a light from one of the tow trucks he drove. His employer pressed charges, but they were dropped after Sells fled the state. Tommy Sells settled in Arnsis Pass, Texas. He was hired to work on a shrimping boat for the Golf Team Shrimp Company. Due to the nature of the work, he would spend as long as 30 days at sea. During these jaunts, the boat was a home away from home. His experience with the shrimp harvest wasn't nearly as wholesome as it was for Forrest Gump. Sells smuggled heroin onto the boat. He overdosed during one expedition. He was saved by one of his colleagues when they discovered him unconscious with a syringe impaled in his arm. The captain of the boat contacted the Coast Guard. It would have taken two days for the shrimping boat to reach the shore. Coast Guard medics were dispatched and Sells was revived. Sells resigned from his position on the shrimping boat and resumed his life as a drifter. He stole yet another car and drove westward, this time to Fremont, California. Speculation has it that during his time in Fremont, he murdered 20-year-old Jennifer Dewey and 19-year-old Michelle Xavier. Dewey was shot. Sells slit Xavier's throat. When Sells departed from California, he wanted to put as much distance between himself and his latest crime scene as possible. Temporarily, as always, he settled in a new location, this time just outside of Niagara Falls, New York. Outside of a bar in Amherst, New York, he murdered 27-year-old Suzanne Kors. Six months later, Tommy Sells started the latest chapter of his life in Winnemucca, Nevada. After dating 20-year-old Stephanie Stroh for a time, he moved in with her. This was not the last. He gave her a hit of LSD, strangled her, and tossed her into the hot springs of the Nevada desert, clad in cement shoes. Sells said he enjoyed this murder more than most, saying, I like to see the life leave her eyes. That was one of the best feelings in the world. This murder has never been confirmed. Salsa said that sometimes he would wake up in places without remembering how he got there. He would also find himself drenched with blood and surrounded by weapons with no memory of how it transpired. Salsa's claimed responsibility for the infamous Dardeen murders though some aspects of his retelling have been disputed. The incident began when Keith Dardeen spotted Tommy Sells hitchhiking in Ina, Illinois. 
Dardine was a kind-hearted sort and offered Sells a ride. You can't hitchhike if you're not prepared to have a conversation with your chauffeur. And after talking for a while, the men hit it off. Keith invited Sells to his home. Sells' version of their introduction was that they met at a gas station where Dardine asked him to go to his house and engage in a threesome with his wife, Elaine. This factor of the story is considered unlikely, since she was well into the third trimester of a pregnancy and her new baby was due any day. Keith's mother, Joanne Dardine, has also disputed the claim regarding group sex. She insisted that Dardine was too protective of his family to consider such an action. What happened once they got Dardine's home, according to Sells, was he shot Keith and mutilated his penis with his knife. He then proceeded to rape Elaine. He bludgeoned Pete, their three-year-old son, with a baseball bat. Elaine's distress activated labor contractions, whereupon she gave birth to her daughter. Sells beat Elaine to death. He did the same to her newborn child. He raped Elaine's corpse with the baseball bat. He put Elaine and her children in their beds, tucked them in, and fled the scene. One account stated that Keith Dardine's body was found in a field near their home the next day. Whether or not Tommy Sells was the perpetrator of this crime, it does demonstrate the nature and extent of his capacity for ruthless, cold-blooded brutality. Due to a dearth of evidence, Sells was never charged with this crime. When police questioned him about it, he got some of the details wrong and then corrected himself, leading the police to assume he was lying. There were many other details cited by Sells that the investigators found were inconsistent with the findings gleaned from the scene of the crime. Police and FBI profilers believe it couldn't have been the work of a newfound acquaintance. The murders were committed with so much malice that they figured the perpetrator must have been motivated by revenge or some other kind of personal animus. Whoever was responsible, their statement after the fact would have reflected that of Tommy Sells. I was just so pissed off that I took it to the maximum limit. In 2014, Joanne Dardine stated that she did not believe Tommy Sells murdered her family. As she put it, Tommy deserved to die for what he did, but I wanted him to stay alive until I know positively he didn't do it. In a newspaper interview published in 2010, Sells said, Joanne wants to talk to me. If she wants to come here and talk to me, scream at me, yell, kick me, hit me, she should have that right. But sorry ain't gonna cut it. So what is there to say? I could tell her sorry every day the rest of my life. It's not going to stop her pain. And one thing I do know about is pain. And it doesn't go away. I don't know if, if I understand forgiveness. I don't think so. Years later, speaking about the Dardine case, Sells said, If you want to believe different, I ain't going to argue the case. Texas will kill me first. Following the Dardine bloodbath, Sells was arrested for stealing a car for the umpteenth time. He left town before he was scheduled to appear in court. From 1988 to 1999, Tommy Sells' nomadic lifestyle went into overdrive. He continuously broke the law and was determined to stay one step ahead of it. He left a streak of blood along the nation's highways that during these 11 years, defied quantification. One murder Sells allegedly committed is that of 11-year-old Melissa Ann Tremblay in Lawrence, Massachusetts in 1988. Though Sells claimed responsibility, there is no evidence that he was the perpetrator. Tremblay was stabbed to death and sprawled over train tracks. She was run over by a train. 
Sells was considered a suspect after Lawrence detective John McDonald saw him on television in 2000, soon after he was arrested. He noted Sells' tendency to utilize trains as transport made him an ideal suspect. After examining the results of an information request Lawrence submitted to authorities in Texas, he made the connection. Two witnesses reported that they saw Melissa standing by a rusted van, talking to a man who was sitting in the front seat. They described the man as, in his early to mid-thirties, unkempt, with a dark complexion and dark hair, including heavy growth on his face that was not quite a full beard. The police took this description with a grain of salt, since Sells had a light complexion. There were no other suspects in the murder. Though the police had no evidence to substantiate Sells' claims about his culpability, he was effective in selling them on that point. It was about this time that Sells met with a mother and her minor aged son in a town near Lawrence. They all panhandled as a family. The next murder Sells confessed to occurred in Salt Lake City, Utah in 1988. The alleged victim was a still unidentified woman and her three-year-old son. He dumped their bodies in the Snake River, located in Idaho. Sells convinced himself that it was okay to murder these children because he was sparing them the pain of living their lives in the absence of the parent who died. Sells' next stop was Tucson, Arizona where he murdered a drug dealer named Ken Loughton due to a deal that went bad. 1989, Sells was more nomadic than ever. January 27, 1989, Sells committed yet another murder, and this one was confirmed. He killed an as-yet unidentified sex worker in Nevada. He hid her remains in Truckee, California. During his confession, he told police where the body was located, and the coordinates matched up with his description. He said he killed her because she turned out to be a trans woman, and he reacted with blind rage, during which his homicidal instincts got the best of him. May 9, 1989. Sells wound up in Roseburg, Oregon. He killed two unidentified females, one of whom was a hitchhiker he picked up, most likely in a stolen car. The same day he was arrested for stealing from his employer. He spent 15 days in jail. August 1989. Sells returned to Little Rock, Arkansas. October, November, and December represented a classic serial killer cooling off period for him, during which he did not commit any murders. He doubled down on substance abuse during this period and was rarely sober. He was even arrested in Oakland, California and Carson City, Nevada for public drunkenness. In December, he was taken to a hospital in Phoenix, Arizona after overdosing on heroin. January 7, 1990. Tommy Sells was arrested and jailed for possession of cocaine in Salt Lake City. He was released the same day when the police discovered the white substance on his person was not cocaine. The true composition of the substance remains unknown. In 2010, Sells did an interview. It was four years before his date of execution. He said, I could have been stopped several times. He claimed that he was once arrested with blood on him that he drew from one of his last victims, a 13-year-old girl from Kentucky. According to Sells, he was put in the drunk tank and let out the next day. It wasn't six hours and I was back out on the street with blood on me. How close does that get to stopping me? Sells was frustrated with the police for not catching on when his actions all but definitively declared that he wanted to be detained and exposed. December 1991, Sells moved to Mariana, Florida. He murdered 28-year-old Teresa Hall and her 5-year-old daughter Tiffany. Another suspect in these murders was serial killer Angel Resendez, a.k.a. the Railroad Killer. In fact, 
Resendez could have been the suspect in other cells' murders, since they covered many of the same real estate and lived similar lifestyles. 1992. Sells was arrested for public drunkenness in Charleston, South Carolina. Later in 1992, Thomas Sells moved to Charleston, West Virginia. There, he attempted to kill a 22-year-old homeless, unidentified woman. She may not have died, but she didn't emerge unscathed. She was beaten, raped, and stabbed. She managed to grab his knife and stab him in retaliation landing 20 cuts. Sells walked away, assuming he had killed her. The woman not only survived the attack, but her testimony was integral in convicting Sells. Sells was sentenced to two to ten years. He was given a light sentence because the rape charge was dropped. Tommy Sells became a lawfully wedded husband once again while in prison. Hybristophilia an attraction to criminals, especially violent criminals, is a spring that gushes eternal as long as violent criminals exist. The tidal wave of blood that washes them ashore shows no sign of drying into desert anytime soon. Sells was released in May 1997 after serving four years. Following his release, Sells and his wife moved to Tennessee with the objective of settling down to a normal life. This was not to last. Sells was a drifter and a murderer, and their domestic bliss was short-lived. October 1997, Tommy Sells returned to St. Louis. After his car broke down near an apartment building, he observed a 13-year-old girl playing nearby. She was surrounded by her family and other adults. After the adults went inside, Sells approached the girl. He raped her and finished her off by strangling her to death. He left her corpse in a pond on a local farm. It was found months later. Sells resumed his career as a carny. In Del Rio, Texas, Tommy Sells met a woman with four children. He married her. Meanwhile, his ex-wife in Tennessee gave birth to his son in 1998. Since Sells would not return to support them, and she didn't want to raise a child alone, she gave him up for adoption. Sells spent the rest of 1998 with his new wife. March 1999. It had been a year since Sells' last rape and murder. He raped and killed 28-year-old Debbie Harris and her 8-year-old daughter, Ambria Halliburton, in Caraway Hills, Tennessee. April 1999. Sells raped and strangled 9-year-old Mary Perez in San Antonio, Texas. He kidnapped her from a county fair. May 1999. According to Sells, he killed 13-year-old Haley McHone by strangulation in a park after raping her. He said it was her blood that he had on his clothes at the time of one of his arrests. After he killed her, he sold her bicycle for $20. There is no evidence linking him directly to this crime. Angel Resendez was also a suspect. Soon after the murder of Haley McHone, Sells was arrested in Madison, Wisconsin for drunk and disorderly conduct between May and June 1999. As Sells left Wisconsin, he abducted 14-year-old Bobby Lynn Wolford in Kingfisher, Oklahoma. He sodomized her and shot her as she ran away. He was only a suspect, but based on evidence and testimony, he is considered the most likely perpetrator. He took a pair of her earrings, which served as a rare article of concrete evidence of his involvement in a crime. December 30th, 1999. Tommy Sells claimed responsibility for a trailer fire that killed four people, Danny and Kathy Freeman, their daughter Ashley, and one of her friends who was spending the night. Sells murdered Ashley and her friend and dumped their bodies in the Red River, which runs along the border between Oklahoma and Texas. December 31, 1999. Sells broke into a home in Del Rio, Texas. 
He knew the occupant, a man named Terry Harris. He normally never murdered people he knew well. He knew him from church. He broke into his home at 4.30 a.m. When he came upon the bedroom of Terry's 13-year-old daughter, Kayleen, he went inside. Her guest, 10-year-old Crystal Searles, was asleep in the same room on the bunk bed. He crawled into the bottom bunk with Kayleen, cut her underwear off with a butcher knife, and raped her. She woke and shouted to Crystal to summon help. Kayleen got out of the bed and tried to leave the room. Sells blocked the door and started stabbing her as he prevented her escape. He stabbed her a total of 16 times, including several slashes on her throat. Sells decided to kill Crystal since she was a witness to the attack. He got up on the top bunk and slit her throat. As Sells left the trailer, he wiped the doorknobs to eliminate his fingerprints. He had broken into the trailer through a window, so he removed several of the screens to make it look as though they may have been dislodged by other means, like the wind. Crystal played dead, and it worked. Once she knew Sells left the trailer, she got out of the bed. She assumed everyone else had been murdered and didn't bother to wake anyone. She went to a neighbor's house. She couldn't talk since her throat had been slit. Sells made a surface cut on her carotid artery. Had he applied any more pressure, he would have killed her. She wrote about what happened on a piece of paper with pen. After first responders arrived and Crystal was treated for her injuries, she told police what happened and described Sells. They identified him immediately. Terry Harris confirmed the description of Sells after discovering his daughter had been murdered. January 2, 2000. Tommy Sells was found and taken into custody. He was charged with the murder of Kayleen Harris and the attempted murder of Crystal Searles. While in custody, Sells confessed to killing Kayleen and trying to kill Crystal. Though many false confessions would follow, his culpability in this case was irrefutable. He was so cooperative with police, he even went back to the crime scene with them and told the story of the murder blow by blow. The details matched up impeccably with those of Crystal's account. February 8, 2000, Tommy Sells was indicted for the capital murder of Kayleen Harris. Sells' trial was brief. The evidence, including Crystal's testimony, made short work of his defense's arguments against his conviction. The jury was particularly disturbed by the photographs that were taken at the scene. Seeing the before and after photos of the living Kayleen and her post-mortem condition was all the convincing they needed to put Tommy Sells behind bars for the rest of his life. September 8, 2000, Tommy Sells was convicted of Kayleen Harris's murder. He was sentenced to death. Tommy Sells was not afraid of death. He seemed to welcome it. In 2010, he was quoted as saying, I think death is the ultimate punishment, but death is not. It's living with this every day is the ultimate punishment. With what I've done, it doesn't go away. What's happened to me, don't go away. What I've done, don't go away. It twists my mind. Every day I wake up with it. I go to bed with it. As I say, death is a welcome relief. If me being killed is what you want, I'm okay with it. You're not going to hurt my feelings, and I'm not going to put up a fuss to save my own life because, in my opinion, I think it's not worth saving. When I was seven years old, they didn't think I was worth saving, so how am I supposed to think any different? April 3rd, 2014. Tommy Lynn Sells was executed via lethal injection. When he was asked if he had any last words, he simply said, No. This is from an interview Tommy Sells did for television. A few times, not all the times, but quite a few times, it was a mother and a kid. And I have an answer for that. Okay. And, and I thought hard about that because it's been like smacked up inside my head a time or two. Uh, I know what I went through as a child. 
the nightmares, the, the, the drama, the reality of, of who I was and, and what was done to me, I never wanted that to the, happen to another person. Tommy Lynn Sells argues that he killed children to put them out of their misery after killing their mother. If I had something against that person. Uh -huh. and, 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 and there was another person there that witnessed it. I didn't want them to uh, carry that on their shoulder the rest of their life. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? Yeah, you were putting them out of the misery they would have had if they had to live through that all that. That's the best I can answer it. Uh -huh. If it was just a question of putting the other person, besides the one that you were targeting, uh, out of the misery of having to live life with missing mama or missing, you know, whoever, um, maybe you would have gone about it in a gentle way. Is there a gentle way? Yeah. Oh, How you know when they'd strap you to a gurney that, that everything inside of you just ain't burning up? Well, there's a difference. And, and, and they say that's humane? I asked him about the power he felt after killing his female victims. You mentioned about the rush, yeah. and, and that makes a lot of sense. Uh -huh. But I can picture that one part of the rush could be, and, and <clears throat> here's why I need to hear from you, the sense of power over other people. They say a woman being raped is all about power. True? Uh, sometimes, a lot of times. I think it's more about sex. I, I did it for the... the, the the rush. I, I, I didn't do it for, for the, the sex, I didn't do it for the power, I didn't do it for the motive. When it's, it's the sensation, tying that scarf around your neck and, and just watching your eyes, it, it just, it's, it, it's, it's the sensation seeing, seeing that skin pull apart. Yeah. It, it, it's, 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 it's the sensation sticking that knife in and, and just pulling and knowing it's sharp enough, just go all the way up. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not the person. It's about the sensation of, 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 of what you're into. Like any, like a heroin or cocaine, you need to have that every so often. Every so often. Yeah. Okay, uh, were you able to get as big a rush killing one of these nameless people as you could from getting there? It did not matter. Did blood not matter. is blood. Uh -huh. It didn't matter man, woman, child. Yeah, no more thrill to kill the mayor of the town than the, the homeless guy on the street. No. If I could have got George Bush to, to Tiny Tim, it wouldn't matter. Today, I might say, you know, Tommy, Dr. Stone, he's okay. And tomorrow I might wake up and say, you know that bastard? He, he, he tried to slide a slip one in on me. You understand? I do. That's why there's this glass. <laughs> he thank. thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.